We are starting a new series on YouTube where I'm going to be listening and responding to your questions in a live format and a shorter format than I would in a podcast. So I'm actually going to set my phone right now because I'm going to monitor how long I'm speaking. The goal is to keep these 15 to 20 minutes short and sweet answering your questions. Overwhelmingly, the most common question I've been asked recently, very likely because I've been talking quite a bit about all these podcasts I've done with Dr. Tom Dayspring, who is a leading expert, lipidologist, also a menopause expert, and just one of the most lovely people I've interacted with, um, not only virtually and also in person, we live in the same city, but we're gonna talk about cholesterol. And I have two questions here. I'm gonna start with Carla's. Carla says, all things cholesterol. Do we still believe in practice to treat high cholesterol? Aside from standard cholesterol panel, thoughts on ApoB, LP little a, et cetera. And secondary to that, Lisa's question, I've been so looking forward to another podcast with Dr. Dayspring. Just so you all know, we've got two more AMAs with Dr. Dayspring that will be out in November and December. We recently discovered through third-party testing, my brother has a gene variant in the LP little a gene, as well as variants in ApoB. He asked his doctor for a lipid panel, ApoB and LP little a test, and the results showed, not surprisingly, high LDL, high ApoB, and an LP little a value of 197. He was put on a statin to reduce the LDL and ApoB. I've read that statins can increase LP little a levels, and I was wondering if you can comment on this. So just briefly, before we talk about what's changing to our lipids in perimenopause and menopause, two things. An overall total high cholesterol, I don't really worry about. It's just giving us information. So if you're a provider, a prescriber, I'm going to emphasize the word prescriber, because if your person that you're working with cannot prescribe medications, you need to work with someone who can. A total cholesterol is just information. I like to look at comprehensive lipid testing. And I've done tons of podcasts around that. We will link the podcast to Dr. Dayspring. I've now recorded nine, um, seven of which are published. Number two, uh, getting to Lisa's question, uh, typically when we are talking about high LDL, we are oftentimes uh, identifying that someone very likely has high ApoB, and we'll talk about this in a second. And it is common to see in traditional allopathic medicine that they throw everything lipid related, they throw a statin in there. Sometimes statins are indicated, and I know that can be controversial, but we know the lowest effective dose is the most efficacious. But interestingly enough, although a statin can lower LDL, technically, and ApoB, it can oftentimes increase LP little a, which means we're going in the wrong direction. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that LP little a is genetically mediated, and there's very few things that we can take that can correct that, unfortunately. But let's get to how lipids change in menopause. You're going to see me looking down at papers because I've pulled several research articles, which will be linked below. So if you are a big research nerd like me, you can go check those out. So let's talk about this overwhelmingly. A lot of what drives changes in lipids in the perimenopause to menopause transition is the decrease in estrogen. So yes, we know estrogen can be 20 to 30% higher in perimenopause, but then towards the latter part of perimenopause, we will see a decrease in estradiol, which is the predominant form of estrogen our bodies make prior to menopause. And then obviously in menopause, we have very little estrogen that we're making. And most of it we are making in the form of estrone, which is a weaker form of estrogen made by fat tissue. I know no one likes that. Those body composition changes, our bodies are looking for a solution to a problem. So estrogen plays this very protective role in many things. In lipid metabolism, it also upregulates these specific hepatic LDL receptors. Hepatic means liver. That's where these LDL receptors are. And it promotes this reverse cholesterol transport and improves triglyceride clearance. So if you are someone in menopause who's like, why in the world are my triglycerides up? Well, it could be that you're a little insulin resistant, which we know in the setting of less estrogen can be can be an issue as well as less muscle mass. And so as estrogen declines, a lot of these things start to avail themselves. We tend to have much more atherogenic lipid panel, which means our lipid panels generally tend to just not look as good, right? And most of the research suggests that this process starts in perimenopause and extends two to three years into menopause. So let's talk about LDL and ApoB. We know LDL typically rises 10 to 15% after menopause and ApoB 
which reflects the number of atherogenic particles that includes LDL, VLDL, ILDL, and LP little a also increases. So it's important to understand that when you see a high LDL, it could be a sign that you also have a correspondingly high ApoB. We know that estrogen normally helps increase this LDL receptor expression, allowing us to kind of take the garbage out to get rid of those LDL particles more efficiently. And so when this estrogen declines, we start to see um, higher LDL and high ApoB. And so the other thing that's interesting, I used to talk a lot about particle size with my patients in cardiology, light and fluffy, buoyant LDL, um, kind of small and dense LDL. We used to say that one was good, one was bad. I, I no longer kind of believe that. But what starts to happen is these LDL particles, again, during this menopausal transition, they tend to be smaller and denser. And we used to believe that it was an automatic reflection of more atherogenic particles. But I think when we're talking in the context of menopause, we just know that there's more inflammation, more oxidative stress, more brewing endothelial dysfunction that is driven by these changes in estrogen. So we know that ApoB is a good predictor of cardiovascular disease risk. We know that cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of women, one in three. And so there's a lot of good research. Again, I'll link it up below. Um, we know that ApoB is a stronger predictor of cardiovascular disease, as I mentioned, and its rise post-menopause directly correlates with higher coronary calcium scores in longitudinal studies. Two studies that I will mention, SWAN and the Elite. And what's interesting is not everyone is getting screened for a coronary artery calcification or a CT angio or a clearly, and they're kind of a stepwise approach. One can rule out soft plaque, one can rule out hard plaque. CT angio takes AI. It's like AI and that CT angio had a baby. So that is the one that is most diagnostic. It's not covered by insurance yet. I hope that will change. But if you're really concerned, that's actually the test that I would advocate for. So that's kind of in a nutshell, some of the things that we're seeing. We also see LP little a, and I've devoted a lot of content to this. Again, we'll link up those day spring podcasts. If you want to learn more, this is largely genetic. It's seven to eight times more atherogenic than LDL. And we know that the loss of estrogen can impact our LP little a levels, but it's interesting. You look at the research, it's saying it's a 20 to 25% increase in menopause, especially those that have elevated baseline levels. So my LP little a was, was high and it got higher in menopause. And that is typically what we are seeing, but a 20 to 25% jump is quite significant, right? That's not 10%. That's not 5%. That's why I think it's important to know your LP little a before menopause and to know it after menopause because LP little a tends to be more atherogenic. It tends to be more problematic. I think the biggest challenge with LP little a is it's not responsive to lifestyle. That does not mean that it's not important to take care of yourself, the sleep, the stress management, eating an unprocessed diet, exercising. It does not mean those are not important. It just means that you could be doing all the right things. And if you are genetically wired and 20% of us are, and if you're African-American, it's 50%. So if you're watching this, please go get screened. A lot of people are walking around with this little ticking time bomb and they don't realize it. And again, I'll link up those studies. Another aspect of lipids that can change in menopause are triglycerides. And according to the research, triglycerides go up about 10 to 20%. I think that has more to do with changes in body composition, loss of insulin sensitivity. Um, it also is technically related to reduced lipoprotein lipase activity and increased hepatic VLDL production, if you want to get technical. And we know that HRT can improve triglyceride behavior. So um, transdermal estrogen, which is what I take, um, you bypass the liver. So that's one thing, but typically has a neutral or slightly neutral effect on triglycerides. Triglycerides are not my problem, right? But for many people that are, sometimes oral estrogen or estradiol can be helpful. Um, obviously, oral estrogi excuse me, estradiol is sometimes controversial because you get uh, some of the first pass effects from taking a medication orally as opposed to reducing absorbing it through your skin. But I would say first line therapies for elevated triglycerides. And what is elevated to me? I think if your triglycerides are greater than 50, there's probably something you need to be doing. 
Um, Dr. Dayspring and I talked about this, that, you know, conventional wisdom, 150 is considered to be under 150 is considered to be fine. I think by the time you get to 75 or 100, you've got a little bit of insulin, sen a loss of insulin sensitivity that perhaps is brewing. So something to consider, go look at your last lipids. Do you have work to do? The lifestyle piece is important. Maybe carbohydrate restriction. It may be that you need to lay off the alcohol, process carbohydrates. Maybe that you need to exercise more. You need to put more lean mass lean muscle mass on sleep, stress, all those things are still very important. And I think when I'm thinking about, you know, what is most important, I think that the changes in menopause make us more prone to developing cardiovascular disease. Independent of aging, menopause marks a pivot towards a higher ApoB particle size, higher triglycerides, higher LP little a. And this is why I think it's really important to screen. What does screening mean? Screening means that you are getting lab work done. And if necessary, you're getting a CAC, a CT angio, or clearly. And as I've mentioned, each one of those has benefits, but the clearly is now an AI uh, CT angio. So you get a lot more information. And I certainly think people that are higher risk, that's probably a better test. Um, I've done a CAC. I've not yet done a CT angio. I probably will go straight to a clearly. Obviously, you have to be in a part of the United States where these are offered. They are offered throughout the United States. But I do think that that is very helpful. The other thing to really think about is if you look at the research, um, transdermal estradiol, which is like the estrogen patch, has the most favorable effects on most of our lipids. It get, You see a reduction in LDL. You can see a modest reduction in LP little a, um, and Dr. Dayspring talked about how estrogen is a modest PCSK9 inhibitor. That's a little bit of a mouthful, but that is the class of drugs that are being utilized to treat high LP little a. They are very expensive. They are oftentimes not covered by insurance, which I think is criminal, but I understand that they're expensive. And so for some people adding transdermal, estrogen therapy can be important. Oral estrogen may also improve LDL uh, modestly, but raise triglycerides because we've talked about how you take a medication orally, it goes right to the liver. You get a first pass effect, which means the liver is trying to metabolize and break down that medication. Probably not ideal for those that are already insulin resistant or have fatty liver, liver or have metabolic disease. Um, we know that micronized progesterone, because inevitably people say, what about progesterone? Um, it's very neutral on lipids. We know that it's estrogen that is the one that has the largest net impact. And so obviously we're still looking at lifestyle, resistance training, adequate fiber intake. What does that mean? Anywhere from 25 to 30 grams a day. If you track your macros and you realize you're eating five or 10 grams a day, don't suddenly try to increase it to 25 or 30. You might get bloated. It can take time. Um, we know that Mediterranean style diets are actually the ones that have been most studied and most efficacious. So that's including things like, you know, leaner fish, leaner poultry, leaner meat, olive oil, nuts and seeds, lots of polyphenol fruits and vegetables. And so the biggest thing is I think with targeted lifestyle changes, transdermal estrogen, and then individualized assessment, and that the risk assessment also includes really looking strategically at whether or not diagnostic testing would be of benefit. Now, I want to talk about a couple research articles. Um, one that I have right here, and it's linked up below, it's JAK. So it's the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. Are changes in cardiovascular disease risk factors in midlife women due to chronologic aging or the menopausal transition? Big takeaway from this is women experience a unique shift in lipids at the time of the final menstrual period. So menopause is demarcated as 12 months without a menstrual cycle. So if your last menstrual cycle was January 1st, 2025, you are not technically in menopause until an entire calendar year. So your last menstrual period, so it talks about this this final menstrual period is the hearkening of all these lipid changes. Monitoring lipids in perimenopausal women should enhance primary prevention of heart disease. So then at least you know what you are looking at. What I found really interesting in this paper, and I took a bunch of notes, number one, the increase in total cholesterol, LDL, and ApoB were substantial around the final menstrual period and were significantly greater than the increases in total cholesterol, LDL, and ApoB before and after that interval. 
The results showed significant increases in total cholesterol, LDL, ApoB within a year. And what's interesting, menopause has a uniform influence on lipids irrespective to ethnicity or race, which I thought was really very telling. There's a lot of other things where sometimes race and ethnicity can play a huge role in how we respond. But according to this journal, this is a this is one of those Sentinel journals. It's a very well-respected journal. I think it's very helpful. This next is a New England Journal of Medicine article. Again, a Sentinel, very well-respected journal. This was 643 women, uh, postmenopausal women, vascular effects of early versus late postmenopausal treatment with estradiol. So 643 women, primary outcome was the rate of change in a test called the carotid artery intermedial thickness, CIMT. It is a special evaluation of your carotid arteries. That's all you need to know. And so they looked at women that were less than six years into menopause versus greater than 10 years. So defined as early postmenopause and late postmenopause. And what they use is oral estradiol therapy was associated with less progression. So again, oral, not transdermal, was associated with less progression of subclinical atherosclerosis measured by the CIMT. Then the placebo, when therapy was initiated within six years after menopause, this is an important distinction. That window is within six years of the transition into menopause, but not when it was initiated 10 years or more after menopause. Estradiol had no significant effect on cardiac CT measures of atherosclerosis in either postmenopausal group. So this is really, really interesting. And this goes along with that timing hypothesis. And I have another video coming up where we'll talk about that. A lot of women are told if you're outside that 10 years, you can't even think about um, replenishing hormones. And there's a lot of decisions that have to be made into that. The last article that I'm looking at that I'm going to share with you is from a menopause journal. The objective was to assess the effects of low dose oral and transdermal estrogen therapy on lipids in postmenopausal women and to study the influence. So the conclusions were that oral estrogen and to a lesser extent, transdermal estrogen decreased total and LDL cholesterol. LP little a was lowered only by the oral treatments. So if you have high LP little a and you're within that magic window, it might be worth having a conversation with your medical provider. Well, this has been fun. Um, we talked about some relevant current research. We talked about some of the changes that occur in the perimenopause to menopause transition. Keep your questions coming. Let me know what you want to learn more about. And we will link up those podcasts that I've done with Dr. Dayspring. I think they'd be an incredible resource for you if you'd like to learn more. And for those that don't remember or don't know, I spent 16 years in clinical cardiology as an NP. I've been a huge lipid aficionado for over 20 years. And to me, being able to educate you all about how to advocate for your health, especially as we know one in three women will die of heart disease, it's really important that we know our specific risks and what we need to be looking for.